This is an EP3 Honda Civic Type R. Now, if you're thinking about buying one of these, you've done yourself a favor clicking on this video because I'm gonna take you through all the common problems, show you everything that tends to go wrong so you can go out there and buy the best example possible. Let's go. So launched way back in 2001, these cars entered into a very different hot hatch landscape compared to what we have today. Back then, having a high revving, naturally aspirated engine wasn't particularly uncommon. Nowadays, it's practically unheard of. I think that is one of the reasons though, that these are so sought after now and still so special to drive. But given that a number of them are now over 20 years old, there's gonna be a few things to check. 20 years old, that makes me feel old. So where do we begin then? Rust. There's absolutely no point starting anywhere else other than with rust on these cars. I actually found an old buyer's guide that said rust isn't much of an issue. That is entirely wrong. Don't listen to that because rust is what kills the majority of these cars every single year. Now the checks are going to begin before you even leave the house to go and view the car. Get the registration of the car you're looking to buy. Go on to the MOT history website. If you don't know how to do it, leave a comment below. I can walk you through it. It's very easy. And what you're looking for is any noting of corrosion, rust, and also welding. If there's an absolute abundance of corrosion or welding, don't even waste your time on that car. Move on to one that's had minimal rust or welding mentioned. So it looks okay on the MOT history sheets, so you go along and see the car, but don't get complacent because there's plenty of friendly MOT testers out there that will overlook their duty to make a quick buck. So remain vigilant when you go and see the car. Where we're gonna start is on these rear arches. What you actually see here is gonna differ depending on whether you're looking at a pre-facelift or post-facelift EP3 because one of the complaints that EP3 got from a lot of customers when they were new was they had a lot of road noise. Now the way Honda looked to rectify that was they fitted carpets into these rear wheel arches here. Sounds great in theory, horrible in practice because they basically act like a sponge, soak up all that water and road grime and expedite the rusting process. So post facelift type R's tend to rust a little worse than these pre facelifts on the rear arches. Now part of the problem with that is, from the outside, we're really only seeing half of the story. We really need a way to view it from the inside, see that inside arch. Now one of the quite well known little tricks is to pop out these rear speakers here and peer down behind them. Obviously that's gonna be subject to the owner who's selling the car being okay with you doing that, but if he isn't, what's he hiding? So leading off of those arches, we've got the sills that run the full length of the car on either side. Now, as you may expect, because they're right in the firing line of any water, road dirt, salt through the winter, these take an absolute beating and it can be a really common area for these EP3s to start rusting. Now, the other thing to check is the jacking points on each of those sills because if they're starting to corrode, certainly lifting the full car's weight on one point is gonna start to make it crumble. So double check carefully. Now, you might have already noticed, but this car's got quite a thick coat of underseal on it. That's a really good thing because it helps to fend off some of this rust. And it's one of the reasons that this particular car, despite almost being on 150,000 miles and being a 2002 plate, has stood the test of time really, really well. However, be very careful about this because if the seller has just very recently applied a fresh coating of underseal, it can make detecting rust really, really difficult. So be extra vigilant if it's just had a fresh coating on there. Not saying they're always trying to pull the wool over your eyes, but check twice. Now, one thing worth mentioning is when Honda released these EP Civics, not just the EP3, EP2 as well, they made quite a big fuss in the marketing about having a completely flat floor. Now that's great for practicality, but it does mean the car lacks a traditional tunnel underneath where an exhaust would usually tuck up into. As a result, the exhaust hangs really, really low on these EP3s, particularly if it's been modified, maybe a larger bore. So just make sure it's not been absolutely destroyed over speed bumps before you buy it. Now I know we've spoken about rust quite a bit there, but it is super important. I know several people who have bought these cars and ended up with a total loss. They've had to scrap it. The rust has been that bad and it's simply down to them not knowing where to check on the car before handing over their cash. Now, thankfully, moving on to the heart of the EP3, it's the Bulletproof K20. Now, that's not to say there's nothing to check, 
We'll get onto that in just a minute, but before we do, quick favor ask from you guys. If you're getting value from this, please do hit the like button. And also, we create these guides for literally every type of car. So if you tend to buy second hand, please do hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification as well. Anyway, the K20. Let's talk oil because these are known oil burning engines. That's fairly normal. The problem comes when an owner isn't aware of that and doesn't keep on top of the oil. Generally, by the point it's putting a light on on the dash, it's too late. Some damage has probably been done. So you really need a vigilant owner who's been checking that oil and keeping it topped up with the correct type. So when you view the car, pull out that dipstick, have a look at the level and also the condition of the oil. Hopefully it's near full and nice and golden. Next, you want to be checking in the history to see if the timing chain has ever been changed. Now these are known to stretch and if it jumps teeth, it can kill the engine. So around about 100,000 miles is where you'd like to see these changed ideally. If it's bad enough, sometimes you'll hear it rattling away. It actually sounds a bit like a climbing roller coaster. Next up, valve clearances. So every 25,000 miles is the correct interval where the valve clearances should be checked and adjusted. But look, we're living in the real world. What type of EP3 is it that you're buying? Is it a £3,000 runaround or is it a £15,000 championship white minter? Now, if it's the latter, of course, I would personally like to see that documented and carried out at the correct interval. If it's a little runaround, on the other hand, however, it wouldn't be a complete showstopper for me if it hadn't been carried out. So on the inside, well, they're fairly rough and ready, aren't they? We're not buying these for creature comforts, that's for sure. It's all about the drive. Speaking of which, we'll get onto it in just a minute. One last thing to show you here, if you buy a pre-facelift, you're gonna get an old school key for it, which I think is quite cool, quite nostalgic. But you also get an equally old school immobilizer, which you need to press in order to start the car. Now these seem to burn through batteries fairly quickly, and it's an awkward little sized battery. I'm gonna add this to the description below, so if you need to get a spare, you can get it from that link. So, out in that test drive then, and what are we looking for? Well, first things first, let the car get a bit of temperature into it, and while it does that, we'll turn our attention to the steering, more specifically, the steering rack, because especially in the pre-facelift EP3s, this was a really common failure area. Now, a good way of spotting whether there's a problem with the car that you're sat in is to safely remove your hands from the wheel. Check and see, does the car pull in either direction when you do that, or does it track straight? Obviously, it should be the latter, it should be tracking straight, but if it's pulling in either direction, that could suggest that the steering rack is headed for failure. Thankfully, a lot of these were repaired under warranty, so it might be quite rare to find one with that problem now, but it never hurts to be vigilant with used cars, believe me. Now, on the engine front, there's a number of things that can prohibit VTEC from engaging correctly. Things like low oil pressure, certain fault codes. So, you're gonna need to get it up that rev range. We're up to temperature now, so I'm gonna drop a couple gears here. And you can hear it change over and go into that magic VTEC. That should be the same on the one that you're looking at, and if it doesn't, be very, very wary. There's a problem there that needs to be addressed. Next up, let's talk about the gearbox in the EP3 because it is one of my favorite components about this car. And that's hard to say given how good a K20 engine is, but it really is that good. Short, snappy, accurate, love them. However, there can be a problem with them and it tends to be relating to the synchro meshes. Now, a couple of ways in which we can test this, be going along in second gear, get right up those RPMs, give it a bit of throttle and go for third gear it should slot in nice and easy. If it's grinding or hesitating going in, that definitely suggests we're looking at a synchro mesh issue there. Now, the other test that you can do is, again, second or third gear. Ideally, both of them test this and both of them. Get on that throttle, get it right up, seven, 8,000 RPM, right into the VTEC zone once again, and come off the throttle fully. Now, watch the gear stick and make sure it doesn't pop out of gear. If it does, once again, more than likely, we're looking at a synchro mesh issue there. Now, final thing to tell you about, we've made it this far, and it's the front shock absorbers. Now, we do sometimes see it on the back as well, but more often than not, it tends to be the front. Classic shock absorber fail. They start to leak fluid, they start knocking over bumps, 
and it's all over. They need replaced. So be on the listen out for that. Try and get yourself a slightly more rutted, rougher road, and that should uncover if they're knocking. As I say, sometimes we see it on the backs as well, but not as common. And there you have it. You now have all the tips you need to go off and find yourself a brilliant Honda Civic Type R EP3. And you really should. It's a hot hatch from yesteryear that's not going to be repeated anytime soon. And actually, really good value as well. Now, reliability-wise, typical Honda, isn't it? Although we've covered some points here, if the car's been taken care of and managed to fend off most of that rust, they're a really quite reliable car as well and it's for that reason we award that a really rather astounding 8.5 out of 10 on a reliability leaderboard now thank you so much for watching if you have enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing my thoughts on how these drive in a slightly more review cinematic fashion then please do click in the top right hand corner now and it'll take you to that video but for now please do hit subscribe and i'll see you next time